What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I'm Daniel Yafusi. Thanks so much for tuning in. And we have finally reached the conclusion of the NFL draft cycle, the NFL draft three day week, uh, three day event wrapping up last Saturday. And the Dolphins, as expected, had a pretty quiet weekend, just four picks after the Tyree Kill trade. They used all four of those picks. No trades, which was a bit of a surprise, but the Dolphins come away with four new members of their squad, and we're going to dissect all angles of that. Uh, I'm joined by Andre Fernandez, Deputy Sports Editor for Miami Herald. Andre, how you doing? Good, Daniel. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a little bit. I'm glad you picked this one. I love the uh, post-draft, kind of looking ahead. We're getting, uh, we're not quite there yet at the season, but this is a good idea now of you know, kind of what additions and what kind of the roster taking shape a little bit more after after the draft. So oh, the roster yeah, most thanks definitely. For having me again. Oh yeah, for sure. The roster is definitely starting to uh, take shape. Like I said, uh, with the conclusion of the NFL draft, the Dolphins also signing several undrafted free agents, um, un- yeah, undrafted rookies, and we're gonna get into that. But we got to start with the Dolphins' uh, first pick. It was a pretty long wait to to pick one or two, um, but it was a it was a wait that was well worth it after the trade for Tyree Kill. Uh, but once the Dolphins got to one or two, they used that pick on Georgia inside linebacker Channing Tindall. Um, it was a position that addressed one of the remaining needs uh, on this team on this defense, and we all know the Dolphins were extremely active um, during free agency, re-signing their own, re-signing other free agents trading for some players, uh, trading away some players, but they come away with the middle linebacker who I think fits really well into this defense. Um, I think that if there was one aspect of the defense that I think that people thought could really be shored up, it was that second inside linebacker spot next to Jerome Baker. Um, You know, they kind of had a piecemeal, a rotation of linebackers, Landon Roberts, Duke Riley, Sam McGuire, and all those guys kind of um, contributing in different ways. Um, But they get a guy in Tyndall who they think can kind of do it all. You know, he was kind of a, uh, he was kind of in a rotation as well, kind of playing next to and behind um, two, also two inside linebackers who were drafted, Quay Walker and Kobe Dean. Um, and, you know, he didn't really play that much his first couple of years uh, at Georgia, but he broke out his senior season, um, you know, obviously helping with that college uh, football national championship run. Um, and they think that he brings sideline to sideline speed. He's physical and they think he can be a factor in all three phases. Um, so I think that it was a really, it was really solid pick. I think one thing that sticks out to me is that when you look at his highlights and you look at his film, he does a lot of the things that Jerome Baker does. Um, you know, he can blitz, he can pursue running backs, he can kind of cover running backs. And I think that that's good because you, you need to have speed on offense and defense, yeah. especially when you're facing mobile dual threat quarterbacks like Josh Allen in the division and uh, Lamar Jackson in, in the AFC. I mean, you need to have guys who can run. I mean, we saw how important that speed was when they played Lamar uh, originally. So I think it, I thought it was a smart pick, but I'm also kind of wondering like did you kind of double down and getting and getting what Jerome does so well and is there a chance that maybe you leave yourself open to some of you know Jerome's weaknesses as well maybe not being as physical against the run not maybe not being able to cover tight ends what, what do you think yeah I mean that that's what you hope doesn't happen because you do need him to be versatile I mean you're right the highlights I saw look the same like they, they 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 amplified the the pursuit factor, which he looks amazing when he's rushing the quarterback. I mean, he's so fast, and nothing to be ashamed of being in the rotation in Georgia with all the talent they had. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, that's great. But as we know, you mentioned you know the not just the mobile quarterback aspect, but nowadays, I mean, the Dolphins are everybody's talking about how the Dolphins are going to be so fast in the wide receiving core, but opposing teams always have those slot guys that are hard to chase down, hard to keep you know, maintain and, and contain the, from getting big gains. And that's the part where you hope that some of that coverage aspect comes into play and he's able to do that at a high level. And, you know, the phys- the physicality part, I mean, yeah, you are going to face also potentially some of these physical big, you know, running backs. There aren't a lot of Derrick Henrys out there, but there are the grinders out there. There's a few, you know, Jonathan Taylor at times, you know, you could end up facing him, you know, I'm, I'm looking outside the division if, if the Dolphins, want to get to where they really want to get to in the playoffs that could end up having some matchups where you face that that pounding running back that could take a toll or more often than not those very fast guys that you want to be able to like hold in the middle of the field and the big tight ends as well like like you mentioned and so to me the intriguing part is like you said if if it's a redundancy there with having Jerome Baker also kind of that same skill set or will you see more maybe of the complete package 
with Tyndall where he can fill some of those spots and really give you what you're looking for in terms of that fitting your defensive scheme and not and, and really containing big plays from happening. Yeah, there certainly is a projection aspect to it because he because he, he only broke out in his senior season. And even that senior year, you know, he only played a, a percentage of the snaps, you know, compared to some of his other counterparts on the defense. I mean, it seemed like I was watch, watching the SEC championship game again and they showed the starting lineup. And it's like literally every player on that defense got drafted. Mm-hmm. So he was playing. I mean, he's he, he did play the integral role, but he, he was kind of in a timeshare. But I think the good thing for him is that, like, you can see you can look at the, at the film and say, OK, he's that you can easily project him into this uh, defense. And I think that he's not going to be asked to do everything. I mean, he's not going to, I mean, I'm not sure if he's going to start week one. Uh, I mean, I think even if he does start week one, they're going to rotate him with the Landon and all those other guys because they know that they have, um, you know, skill skill set that can contribute to this defense. So the good thing is that he won't have to, like, do everything. He won't have to be that three-down linebacker from day one. He can kind of focus on what he does really well, and then they can kind of put more on his plate as the year goes on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if that's it, that's the luxury of having that where you're not going to put too much and 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 then we'll see as the, as we get through OTAs, like you said, this off season. I mean, remember this is going to be a, a, an interesting off season. Just be the adjustment period all over the place. You know, everyone getting kind of used to what what Coach McDaniel likes to do on both sides of the ball. So, but I'm looking forward to it because I think that I think just from just from looking at those highlights. I mean, I know you said it's not the entire career of Georgia. We've only seen maybe like the, toward the lat, toward the end of it where he really broke out, but I think he's got it. I think that again, it really comes down to, can he do a lot of the fundamental things in coverage and be that complete linebacker, that complete piece for them? Yeah. So the first pick of the Dolphins draft wasn't real. It wasn't a real surprise. I think a lot of people um, first saw them taking a, a, a linebacker, especially Channing Tindall. He was a popular pick in mock drafts, but as we shifted to day three of the draft, the Dolphins had three picks. Uh, one in the fourth rounder, two in the seventh rounders, and there were there were a bit of surprises, and I think that that started with the first round, uh, the fourth round pick, um, Texas Tech wide receiver Eric Azukama. I don't think that a wide receiver was on a lot of teams, or I mean, a lot of people's radars when it came to the Dolphins after they, you know, did so much to to add Tyree Kill and add Cedric Wilson. Um, so, you, so there was you had a little bit of a surprise there when I think a lot of people expected maybe offensive linemen, running back, something like that. Yeah. And then we get to the seventh round where, you know, we're, we're wrapping up, you know, we're myself personally, you know, we're in the media room, the, the interview room about to talk to Mike McDaniel and, uh, and Chris Greer. And we see the, the ticker on TV and it goes the Miami Dolphins select Skylar Thompson quarterback from Kansas, Kansas state. And I mean, I even put it on Twitter. I was like, the only position I'd be surprised if they took today was quarterback. And of course they took a quarterback. Um, so within all that, they don't come away with an offensive lineman. And again, they have just four picks. Um, Chris Greer said that he tried to move up a couple of times, but he didn't want to give up those high draft picks um, next year. Um, he said his phone really wasn't ring- ringing to move back. So he just stayed put and picked uh, their four guys. But again, no offensive lineman. Um, that was a bit of a surprise to me because Chris Greer spoke so much about um, how, you know, how deep this offensive line class was. Um, he spoke about. I mean, he, he literally said at the owner's meeting a month or two ago, we're going to add competition for Michael Dieter. Um, so, you know, that was a bit of a surprise to me. Now, if people haven't seen it yet, um, our own Barry Jackson reported Tuesday um, afternoon that um, actually Connor Williams has been taking some snaps at center during the office and workout program. So maybe that's the competition that Chris Greer was alluding to. But again, to not draft an offensive lineman or not to come away with an offensive lineman in the draft, you know, that they signed some undrafted rookies. How much of that of, uh, was a surprise to you? I think a little bit, because especially when they talked about the center position, I mean, I remember, you know, you guys were reporting too throughout the off season, how much they wanted that, you know, to kind of push Michael Dieter a little bit and see where that, that spot kind of shaked out. So it did surprise me that at that point, especially drafting, you know, a little more, a little higher end type caliber player that, that could play the center position. But I mean, I guess they're confident in what they have. And and when you look at some of the undrafted signings, they did actually pick up a few linemen uh, from the looks of it. I mean, Ty Clary was one of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if some of these guys are going to play center or uh, yeah, but Clary, they Clary's an interior lineman. So yeah. yeah. So that's one. But I mean, you know, you're hoping maybe. These are maybe some diamonds in the rough that maybe come through and 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 surprise and maybe earn some reps. But it's not like it wasn't it wasn't as as surefire a thing as as potentially it could be when you're getting a middle rounder in the draft 
with a little more pedigree, a little more, you know, track record there where you think maybe this is a guy that can contribute. These other guys, you know, you don't know, maybe it would take a little bit more to, to, to break through there, but we'll see. I mean, maybe Connor Williams is the solution and maybe they feel confident that, that he can do the job if Michael Dieter were to struggle. Yeah, one thing that stood out to me was, you know, the first question I asked uh, Chris Greer was about, you know, drafting a wide receiver in the fourth round and just overall not coming away with a center. And he said, um, you know, we didn't want to reach for anybody. We followed the best player available. You know, we we that's what we the philosophy and the mantra that we follow. And me coming from coming from Baltimore, you know, you hear that so much uh, with with Ozzie Newsome, the former GM and now Eric DeCosta. They always say best player available. We're not going to reach. You know, it might not be a position of big need, but we're going to take the best player available and make it work and I thought it was interesting to hear that for the first time from Chris Greer and especially in the context of them only having four picks because you would think that with less picks you would you know kind of focus more on hitting those positions in need but he said no we're just going to get you know the the best of available players on our board at the time that we're picking and it's funny that you know in the seventh round that happens to be a quarterback um you know it's a I was kind of confused on that pick at first just given the fact that they have you know their starter in Tua and they have a definite backup in Teddy Bridgewater. You know, they paid him way too much money for him not to be the backup this year. Um, so I thought it was an interesting pick. And the more I thought about it, I was like, hmm, well, I mean, first off, even Skylar Thompson himself said he was a bit surprised that the Dolphins picked him because he talked to some other teams a lot more than he did the Dolphins through the draft process. But when I thought about it, I'm thinking, okay, if you don't pick him now, he's going to be an undrafted free agent. And then him and his agent are kind of laying weighing the landscape and looking at the landscape and saying which is which position or which uh, team is best for me um so you already kind of have that working against you because you have a, a definite starter into it this year and a definite backup um so you get him under contract you get him working with your coaches for the next the coming weeks and months through training cramp um you know best case scenario is you know maybe he does prove something to you and you're saying hey we got to keep this guy as our third QB, and then you just end up using a 53-man roster spot on him. If not, maybe you cut him. Um, but again, it's when when you get to the uh, roster cut down, I mean, or there's so... A, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's... Be, what I'm saying could be a practice. The squad guy developmental type season for him, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. When you get to the cut down, I mean, there's there's so many guys that are available. I mean, the chances of somebody picking him up and off waivers as a backup, they're kind of slim to none, you know? I mean, I'm not sure how much he's going to be able to show during the preseason and training camp and whatnot. You only have three games anyway. Um, so there's a good chance that he's going to come back to the practice squad, and then you kind of have a read to net situation where this guy's on the practice squad, you're developing him maybe next year. <laughs> You'll have to pay Teddy Bridgewater however much money. I mean, they're paying him a lot of money to be a backup. So maybe after a year's worth of development and coaching and whatnot, he's avail- he's ready to be your uh, your number two quarterback, and then you're paying your number two quarterback, not a lot of money. Hopefully Tua shows something and he's playing better and, you know, he sticks around if uh, Dolphin fans are crossing their fingers that, you know, he he performs like he's expected to. So you have two expensive, inexpensive quarterbacks yeah. and you can start to use that money elsewhere. I actually think it makes sense the more I think about it. I mean, and you don't want to have, you don't want to have Skyler out there on the field in the middle of, of a real game right yeah. away or anything like that. But, you do have two quarterbacks that have a, a pretty lengthy injury history too. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the other part of it that, you know, maybe they thought, especially in the seventh round at that point, let's try to get a guy that maybe we feel has, has some upside ha- that can develop, you know, and, and obviously you don't want to throw him in the fire this year, but yeah, you want to be set in case, you know, if, if these are your, the two guys you're going to roll with, but again, we know what's happened, you know, with Tua and with Teddy, unfortunately in the past. So, you know, as far as that goes, let's see if maybe, if they can get, you know, more insurance, the more depth, the better. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. I mean, I know COVID protocols aren't going to be as, um, you know, as rampant. I mean, there's really no COVID protocols now, so we shouldn't see guys out for that. Um, but we've seen, you know, whether it's injuries or whatnot, that you that QB depth can can dwindle. So you yeah. need guys that can step in and get the job done. So we'll see what happens and how he fares over the next coming months. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back on the other side of things, uh, we're going to discuss some of these undrafted rookies. Can the Dolphins find their next Nick Needham uh, in this crop um, as well as uh, talk about what's next for the Dolphins as they transition um, further into their offseason workout program. So stay locked with us. What's going on, everybody? Still here on the Dolphins in Depth podcast talking all things Dolphins in the NFL draft, uh, the three-day event concluding last uh, Saturday. 
And again, it was a it was a quiet weekend for the Dolphins, but they were uh, they were right back at it right after the uh, the selections concluded, um, right on the phones trying to get some undrafted free agents into uh, their rookie minicamp. Um, you know, again, they only had four picks, so they were uh, able to kind of cast a wider net, get a lot more guys into uh, into the rookie mini camp. And um, you know, on the Miami Herald website, we have um, reporting and details on a bunch of guys that they're bringing in. Um, at least 14 undrafted rookie signings right now. They haven't officially announced that. I don't know those guys, but right now it's looking like they're they're going to bring, you know, at least a dozen guys um, into rookie mini camp, um, which starts late next week. Um, as you look through some of these names, you know, they, they have some local guys, um, you know, they have a former teammate of Javon Holland, Veron McKinley, the third, who's, who's also a safety. They have a, a tackle who was actually regarded pretty highly and expected to, to be drafted, but did not in Arizona State's Kellen Deesh. Um, Do any of these guys stand out to you? Do you think any of these guys can break through and, uh, you know, maybe make the 53 man roster? I mean, we saw uh, two guys last season in Trill Williams and Robert Jones, but any, anybody can uh, do that this year. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to tell, I mean, with some of these guys, because obviously you're looking at, you know, so many factors. But, I mean, a lot of guys that actually played down here in the past that, that, that caught my eye. I mean, one of them that kind of would be interesting to see how he performs is uh, DeAndre Johnson. You know, former, he went to Southridge High down here and, you know, played four years at Tennessee, had 10 sacks. So a little up and down there, but. I mean, we'll see. We'll see if he can he can contribute, if he can maybe earn some sort of a spot. I mean, you know, looking at the the group, I mean, I know we mentioned Clary. I mean, just the fact that they need some center depth there potentially could be something, could be a, a guy that, you know, comes in. I mean, I, I know punter doesn't, you know, get talked about too much, but what if something happens and Thomas Morstead's not what they not what they want? You know, I know they signed the FIU punter, Tommy Heatherly, but but no, there one one name that really stands out to me. I think just because you know, every, whenever you see SEC guys, especially guys that play at a high level in a high powered offense, I mean, Braylon Sanders is one name. Mississippi wide receiver didn't have a ton of yards, but you're playing in that conference and you're playing you know high level competition all the time, playing a lot of good teams, a lot of good defenses there as well. And and you know with Matt Corral and that group at Ole Miss, I mean, that could be that that could be someone. You never know. I mean, they're they're pretty. They have a pretty good amount of depth, and I know that obviously they drafted, they they drafted a wide receiver as well. But you never know. I mean, they, wide receiver is another position that you know the more depth you have, the better. It doesn't hurt. So, yeah, this is a this is an interesting interesting free agent, a rookie free agent uh, crop, and I think that just in general, it's going to be interesting to see because I think that, and I think that you would agree. I think a lot of people would agree that compared to last year, this roster is much much better and it's much deeper than it was last year. Um, so again, you have two undrafted rookies that make the team last year. It's going to be, I think it's going to be tough. I mean, I, I look at which positions are kind of bare right now. Um, and I, I don't know if you could, I mean, I'm off the top of my head. I mean, I don't think running backs, I know uh, is bare. I know that they brought in, um, I think it's South Carolina running backs are Quandre White. Um, he he yes. had a pretty, pretty nice career in college. Um, but, but even so, I mean, I, maybe he could push Savan Ahmed or Miles Gaskin for that, that, you know, third running back spot. I, I would expect them to keep uh, three or four running backs on the roster. It's going to be interesting to see how the numbers play out because, you know, they're keeping a fullback on the roster this year um, and they're going to have several tight ends. Um, so maybe he's a guy that could push for a final running back spot. Um, I look at, again, a guy like Ty Clary or D. who, um, you know, those, they, they had a lot of starts in college, you know, and we did talk about how the Dolphins didn't come away with uh, any offensive linemen in the draft. So maybe that's a possibility, but, but even on defense, I mean, the defense, they brought everybody back. So there's not a lot of, a lot of, a lot of spot, a lot of spots there. One thing I will say is I think uh, the, the signing of Verone McKinley, uh, like I said, Javon Holland's old yeah. teammate, that is a really, really interesting, um, interesting signing. I actually spoke to him a little bit at the, at the combine, just kind of, just kind of catching up with them and introducing myself and whatnot. I um, mean, and he said that he talked to Javon during the, during the draft process, he was helping him out. And he said that the Dolphins even spoke to him as well a lot. Um, so that was interesting. I mean, he was, uh, if he wasn't a Thorpe winner, he may have won the Thorpe award for the best defense tobacco. He was definitely a finalist. Um, I mean, he is viewed as a ball hawking safety. Um, I yeah. think the knock on him and the reason why maybe he wasn't drafted is because first off, he didn't test as well um, as, you know, a, a player of his caliber um, was probably expected to. And he's a bit smaller. I mean, he's not 
you know, put together the way Javon Holland is. So he's not um, that player that's going to be roaming around the box and helping a lot um, against the run. But if the Dolphins really don't have a backup free safety, you know, Jason McCourty, you know, um, was got injured, had a season in, in injury. He wasn't re-signed. Um, Eric Correll is more of a strong safety, close to the box guy, like, like Brandon Jones. They really don't have a backup safety, free safety right now. And again, I think that there's a possibility. I think there's if there's one position, if there's one person that I think could maybe make their mark in training camp, you know, maybe he intercepts a couple passes and he, you know, everyone's tweeting about him and talking about him. Maybe he's the guy who could kind of break through and uh, end up on this 53 man roster as an undrafted rookie. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, looking at some of these numbers, I mean, I, he he strikes me as as a playmaker despite being a little undersized. You know what I mean? And those are the types of guys that you know, over the years, you see they impress coaches and, and earn a spot. And, and the situation would be fitting for him, you know, to be able to slide in and, and at least provide some depth. I think maybe this isn't maybe he doesn't start necessarily, but I think he's a quality. He's just another quality layer you can add back there at, at that free safe free safety spot to do something. Because 11 interceptions is pretty good, you know, considering. And again, he's another guy who's playing at a high level, having played at Oregon, Yeah. you know, and if he's even, you know, close to kind of another Javon Holland, like his former teammates, that, that type, that skill set. Again, I, I just think it, it's yet another case where we were talking about the depth of the roster. Here's another guy that if he performs well and, he, and, and, and catches their eye, I think it could be yet another. And that's what you need. You need that three, four, five deep at each spot quality where you can rely on these guys because injuries are going to happen. And the interesting thing is, I just remember this as well. The interesting about Verone McKinley is that he was actually the reason that Javon started off playing a lot of nickel because they wanted him. They wanted Verone McKinley at safety. So that's why Javon Holland has all that experience playing outside cornerback, nickel cornerback. Um, and then, you know, as he, you know, kind of developed more, then he moved to safety as well. So that's really interesting. And again, I think that that's definitely a name uh, to look out for. So as we transition into, you know, the Dolphins are, are a month into their offseason workout programs. We have a uh, rookie mini camp um, late next week, starts late, late next week. We have OTAs and then obviously the, the, about the one month break before training camp. Um, we're looking at what's next for the Dolphins. I mean, they still have less than $20 million dollars. Uh, in cap space, more than enough money to bring in a potential impact player, whether that's on the offensive line or elsewhere. Um, There was a report earlier this week that uh, they were in discussions with uh, free agent defensive lineman um, Carlos Dunlap and Akeem Hicks. Um, We also know that uh, they brought in uh, former Chiefs linebacker Melvin Ingram for a visit last month. So maybe the Dolphins are potentially looking at, you know, adding more to that stack defensive line. Um, what would you like to see the Dolphins do in the coming weeks and months before uh, we get to training camp? Is there a certain player or a position you'd like them to really uh, fortify? I mean, I'll take a Carlos Dunlap with a side of Akeem <laughs> Hicks, please. I mean, I, if we if we learned anything from the L.A. Rams, you can't overload your defense enough. So to me, I know people are going to say maybe they have other spots like, you know, the O-line. and but. I wouldn't blow the bank just on uh, the remaining bank, just on getting maybe one more old lineman. I mean, I, if you can bring a quality pass rusher type like that, I mean, I know you have a few already that, that you're hoping can, you know, enhance that on, on the backside, but I, I think the more the merrier on that part of it. I mean, the more you can pressure the quarterback in this league, the more you can disrupt offenses, the better. So if, if a guy, if maybe not, if any of those, either of those two guys are available and they can pull some kind of a deal like that, that's what I'd love to see because, again, I don't think you can overload it enough. I think the more you can, it's just going to be that much better. No, most definitely. I know, and a lot of fans have been clamoring for this move, and you've probably heard it as well. Um, the, the one guy who I think, and again, we haven't we haven't heard too much on it throughout the free agency, um, but J.C. Treader. I mean, we we questioned and questioned the center position all off season. Um, we know that Connor Williams is starting to take some snaps there. He's kind of practicing there as well as left guard. Um, But I just look at the moves that the Dolphins have made over the past weeks and months. You trade for Tyree Kill. um, You spend so much money to, uh, you know, to fortify this offense. And they, the way they made moves was to win now. I mean, they made the types of moves that a contender makes because they think that they can compete and contend now. 
So again, we don't know exactly what's going on. It's been kind of quiet on the J.C. Treader front from the beginning. But if there's interest on the Dolphin side, if there's interest on his side, I mean, why not? Why not get a veteran established center, really fortify that that uh, offensive line and just get the ball rolling? Again, we have some questions at right tackle, but we know left tackle is going to be solid. We know right, t- right guard is going to be solid. If Connor Williams stays at left guard, we know that he's an above average to good left guard. But then you put a legitimate veteran Pro Bowl caliber center in the middle of all of it who knows the system. I mean, then we're really cooking on offense. What, what do you think about that move? Yeah, I mean, if you can get someone of that caliber, yes. I, I just don't think I don't think you spend if you're if you're just going to bring up like a body just to bring someone in. But if yeah. you can get a high caliber that you can count on with that kind of veteran experience up front, absolutely. That's the only reason I, I kind of went the other route because again, I just love the fact that if you can get proven players at on the defensive side of the ball that can really disrupt offenses the way those two can. I would have gone that route, but yeah, if, if you're, if you're talking about an option that's going to solidify and you don't, and then you don't have to start questioning anymore about Michael Dieter or anybody else, or how are we going to mix and match this? Because think about, and also too, that that running game is going to be such a big part. Yeah. You need that, you need that, you know, anchoring right there in the middle to be, to be solid. So yeah. If they can get that kind of uh, a player of that, of that, with that kind of a uh, talent level and upside. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they got the money, too. I mean, they got the money to bring yeah. <laughs> two, two impact guys. I mean, a little less than $20 million. Yeah. I know the Dolphins are definitely going to save some of that. I mean, they got to use some of it to sign their uh, their rookie class, which, to be honest, isn't a lot of money because they only have four picks. Um, you know, they can take some of that money um, into next season. I know that they're gonna, obviously going to set aside some money for during the season and, you know, if there's injuries or moves to be made. But that's a lot of money to sit on right now. So, again, if you can get an yeah. impact guy, whether, again, it can be offensive line, it can be defensive line. Um, but if you can get a guy that can really impact the trenches, um, we're rolling. I mean, I think the, the roster is already looking really, really good. You know, I, I'm bullish on what this team can be in 2022. Um, but if you can add another guy on the trenches, because that's where the games are won and lost, I think yep. you're, you're really rolling for sure, you know. Yeah, and I, I think they will. I think it's too much, especially the the trend of this offseason, the way it's been. I, I, I can't see them sitting on it too much. Yeah, like you said, I mean, I, I, I would be shocked if they did. Yeah, yeah. We'll see um, what the team uh, has in store over the coming weeks and months before training camp. Uh, but that brings us to the end of another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I want to thank Andre so much for joining me to talk all things uh, Dolphins in the draft and recapping um, a really interesting weekend. I mean, we had Thursday night with a bunch of wide receiver trades and you kind of thought back to the Dolphins and their trade for Tyree Kill. Uh, you know, you only have one quarterback going in the in the first round and then, you know, a lot of them uh, lasting a lot longer than we expected. And the Dolphins finally get uh, on the clock and they kind of throw a curveball with some of their picks. Uh, but it was a fun weekend for sure. And uh, it's definitely going to be an interesting weeks to follow um, as we kind of lead up and, and get closer to training camp. Um, but hope you guys enjoy the rest of the week. And we'll be back next week to discuss another uh, week of Dolphins football. Until then, you guys take care. See ya.